Well, this is actually a little different from the, the story. I mean, the, the title is Evolving Languages because it looks at, you know, you wait for one, for one language, as you know, I get five in one go. Um, uh, uh, five languages um, uh, with an overlap of people, the same people working on them, mostly coming out of Bell Labs, AT&T Bell Labs, or Lucent Bell Labs, and then finally Google with Golang or Go. Um, and there's sort of, uh, I've seen in several places a suggestion that there was a, almost a kind of linear progression of the development of these languages. And so I'm taking a slightly different look, looking at each one of the languages uh, in turn, and then looking at how the different decisions about type systems and uh, packaging and modularity and other aspects of the language, the system interfaces and so on, um, differ from language to language and, and, and why that might be. Um, so that it's evolution, not in a linear sequence, but in the sense of uh, things walking off in different uh, uh, um, chains of development. Uh, and it, it doesn't look specifically at the development of Go, uh, partly because when I started into it, I discovered that actually Rob Pike has got to talk about the development of Go, in which he does take a slightly linear view of this development, um, reasonably enough since he was responsible for uh, four of the five, uh, directly responsible for each one of the languages involved. Um, and so his view of it is, is, is probably is in terms of that linear thing. My view is that of, of someone who was involved uh, in using uh, several of the languages here uh, for some time uh, and also uh, acquiring one of the languages uh, in, in the course of my uh, time uh, with uh, a company called Vita Nova, which acquired the Inferno operating system and therefore got um, a language to go along with it. Um, Let's see if this, oh, that works. So here's, here's the, this of the linear history. Um, it, it, a lot of the overlap in the languages goes back to um, uh, Tony Hall's um, communicating sequential processes, the second version of that, that's the version where processes communicate using channels instead of sending a message directly to a process, which was the 1978 version. Um, and it's dated 1985 here because that's the date on the, my copy of the CSP book. But of course, there were papers um, uh, uh, in CACM and elsewhere describing the system before that. And that, that's why this first language, Squeak, um, a language for communicating with mice, which is Cordelli and Pike, um, uh, um, makes use of the um, ideas of CSP in the language design. Uh, then in 1992, as part of the Plan 9 operating system, uh, Phil Winterbottom uh, developed a, a concurrent programming language, which was also CSP inspired. Uh, in 1994, Hog Pike returned again to look at using um, a bigger language for communicating with mice, um, and this time doing a complete window system. Uh, in 1996, as part of the Inferno operating system project, they developed a language called Limbo, um, and uh, which is uh, the one that we took over when we, we when we acquired um, Inferno from Lucent. And finally, quite a bit later, you can see um, there's a development of this new language Go by um, a group of people at Google, including someone who was involved in the uh, a lot of the Oberon 2 work. Um, so the language actually does reflect um, for, for, for a change uh, some different uh, perspectives. So it's, so a lot of this I don't know how. Um, just a moment. It's just about tolerable. Um, you won't have to read and, and, and work out the thing. There a lot of these code fragments I'm showing you are fairly complete to give a good flavor of, of each language, but they're not intended to be. Uh, I'll, I'll talk through some aspects of them, but they're not intended to be uh, um, understood or grasped as a whole. And these slides are also fairly dense compared to my usual ones. Um, um, and I will be making those available, of course. Um, so this is a, a squeak program, and it's used. It's a language that was that was used to to explore the idea of using CSP um, ideas to um, write user interfaces uh, instead of using the event-driven style. We have a big event loop, and you and you maintain data structures that keep track of a state. Uh, so you have an event loop that manages a whole series of state machines. Then you have to reason about this stuff. And if you've ever had to work through back through some code that's broken that uses this technique, you find that it's actually rather um, uh, tedious and you end up having to build up state diagrams and so on. So here the idea is that you have 
So the squeak program is um, a collection of processes followed by a main program that um, combines them in various ways. The ampersand operator starts off a process. So this says, you, um, the, the purpose of this program is um, to, um, uh, to deposit text at places where, you, where you, uh, you, you click with the mouse and you type, and then it puts the, it puts the text where the, where, the, where the mouse is. And so you've got a, a process that waits. So the question mark is receiving, uh, the exclamation mark is sending on a channel. So the question mark is receiving on a channel. Some channels return values rather than just the event. Um, and so this is waiting for the button to go down and then it receives a point and then it moves to the point. The issues are a, 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 um, a sends on the channel to cause um, um, a process to move to that um, location. And then it waits for the button to come up and then it goes back and does mouse again. Uh, similarly, the keyboard thing sits there reading uh, um, characters in the keyboard and assembling them into lines. And finally, text is the process that actually drops the completed lines of text wherever the mouse is, uh, you, you've clicked with the mouse. Um, and this finally um, launches each one of those things as separate processes. And so you have this, you, you can reason about this one independently of this one. Um, each thing does a little bit of the task and it, it, it's sort of self-contained. Um, and it was used to, to experiment with building small UI components. Uh, you'll see this braced bit there. What, what the language really is, is a wrapper around invocations of C code. So it provides the CSP structure, um, but it's um, C code that actually does the work a bit like Yak actions, if you think of that. And the implementation was to um, compile this into um, a state machine that looked at all the interleavings. So there weren't really representations of channels as such. Instead, it, 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 it sort of produced a, a big state machine to represent that. And um, um, uh, it received uh, inputs from the surrounding environment. So it was, a, it was, a, it was sort of a, an experiment. Um, then there was LF. And this was going, this is a, 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 a programming language that was used extensively um, by you know, a small group of people, extensively on the Plan 9 operating system, Plan 9 from Bell Labs. Um, and it has, uh, uh, it's like most of the rest of the languages here, unlike Squeak, has a very C-like approach, uh, sorry, syntax, um, uh, with the ex addition of, of new types. So there's an ADT, abstract data type, which allows you to add a bit like a struct, but allows you to have member functions uh, or methods associated with the type. Um, and there's this, so you've got the specification and then somewhere else you've got the, the body of that. Um, it was unusual in that it also provided parametric polymorphism. So you could pass in a type to, to parameterize, say a stack type by type T. Um, and there was a rudimentary um, error recovery structure. And, and um, so high, slightly more type um, secure versions of allocation and, and an allocation so malloc and free, if you like. Um, as well in its type system, it had tuples. Um, so a tuple is, is essentially a, 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 a group of, of, of um, um, unnamed um, um, fields um, that sort of work as a unit. Uh, and it also had um, a, a type called poly, which was um, um, essentially, it, it allowed you to box and unbox any kind of value, and there was a type case to allow you to pull out, uh, something out to inspect what type it was. This is the so this is the this is the style of of, of a process. Um, this is one that starts up a keyboard process and a mouse process. So it's, there's some similarity to the functionality of the uh, Squeak program earlier. Um, it so that you, you receive from a channel that. Um, um, that represents keyboard uh, data, so uh, characters typed on the keyboard, and there's another channel that has uh, uh, values arriving from the um, from the mouse, and the process then has a, a non-deterministic select here that um, selects between the keyboard and the uh, and the mouse. Uh, so when a keyboard event is is available, it it processes this bit. And if a mouse available as event, is pro it, 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 it will process that. It waits until one of those is true. If several are true, it makes a choice randomly between the two. Um, 
but the system it's a very it's a very low level language because it was intended to do um, system programming on the level of C um, so here's a here, here, um, so here's what you might have as the body of as the body of a mouse proc um, and this is interfacing now to the operating system so that it's opening a file that produces in the Unix style that produces the mouse data and it's reading reading that in um, if it gets an end of file or, or an error it then sends a message uh, a, an integer value on this terminating channel to, to notify the rest of the program that it's going and otherwise it sends an event that represents the mouse data in some data structure m event um, that's produced for decode mouse it sends that on um, the mouse channel and it just keeps doing this and this is quite characteristic of programs uh, even now with Go that uh, interface with some operating system thing and want to produce a, a, a values on a channel, you have a process that, that, that does that. Um, let's back up a, bit, a little bit. Um, each one of these procs corresponds to a real operating system process, a plan nine process. Um, if you think about it as being um, rather um, a streamlined Unix process. Unix process is quite big. The Plan 9 processes, for various reasons, are, are, are a bit leaner than that, but they're still fairly chunky. Uh, it also had a thing called task, which is really a coroutine, uh, a, a cooperative scheduling, whereas the process is being scheduled by the operating system. And you can have, a, you can have tasks inside a process. Um, Uh, then there's a language, new squeak. So this is done by Rob Pike. Um, uh, I'll just back up a minute. One of the things about LF is that um, you're doing manual, uh, uh, actually you can see in here, you're doing manual storage allocation. Um, and this turned out to be a, 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 a real, I wrote quite a few things in LF and it turned out to be a, a bit of a nuisance because you're always having to do your own reference counting um, to keep track of, of, of who owned which piece of, of, of data. Um, so, as, no, the original Squeak um, did small user interface things, and it wasn't a complete language. New Squeak is, is a com com complete language. It has an implicative style. That's to say that the values are immutable. Um, and uh, it emphasizes, um, uh, it, sorry, it, the main thing that came out of it was, was to do a, a realistic window system using CSP the CSP approach of communicating sequential processes instead of having, as was true at the time with say Sonos and, and, and other systems, Solaris, uh, Sonos and Solaris uh, and SGI systems where you, you inevitably had this, again, this event loop that, that drove your application. So here the, the idea was to see whether you could have a simpler structure um, if you were to make use of, of, of communicating processes. So again, it's very similar to LF, uh, you have a, a non-determinist select. You have lots of channels going here. Um, there's a control channel on which uh, messages can be received to shut down things, and then it forwards those on outgoing control channels to subsidiary processes to tell them to, to, to do things, um, to process size changes, and so on. Uh, now, one unusual thing about the structure of this thing is that, is that um, the... Yeah, yeah, Ignoring some of the, 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 the detail, this actually comes from the Windows system program. But at the logical level, you had a channel producing mouse events, a channel producing characters from the keyboard, and a channel producing strings, arrays of chars, corresponding control requests. And that was the interface to the Windows system. Each one of the Windows system's applications also had exactly the same signature. It took a, ch a channel of mouse events, a channel of keyboard events, and the channel of, of control events. Um, and so one of the effects of this was that because the window system itself matches the signature of its application and because the structure of the window system was to filter the, the values on its channel corresponding to physical location on the, on the screen, in other words, if something had the focus, um, then it got the characters on its keyboard thing. Otherwise, another process got characters on its keyboard channel. Um, the result was that within this window system, you could run the window system 
under itself, and so you could have a little window system in, running inside the window system because the thing was 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 uh, systematically recursive. Uh, but again, this is of the general style of this uh, programming language, which, if you know Go, will will already be looking a little familiar. Right. Diversion. So. I started off with five programming languages, and I'm going to throw in not one, but two operating systems, uh, because that sets the context for the next language. So Plan 9 was done by a group that the, the Unix, uh, uh, um, uh, Unix room group at Bell Labs, when they were wanting to do a system, if you like, a Unix for a distributed networked environment. The problem with Unix being that, that it regarded itself as being entirely in control of the whole universe, and they wanted a system that was designed um, to understand that, that there, were, there were machines other than itself. But the key thing about Plan 9 is that its resources, all the resources and system that were distributable, were represented by, by little directory structures, namespaces, little file systems. Now, these are all, there's nothing on disk or storage. It's, it's just a, a representation of it. So you have a hierarchical namespace. You can navigate it by changing directory, by walking from directory to directory. You can open names in that, and you can read and write them, you know, depending on permission. So that's the first idea. The second idea was the sort of idea of a computable namespace. That's to say that you build a process, builds a namespace in which it works, or you build a, a namespace for a process in which it can work. Um, by applying operations, bind, mount, and unmount, none of which are privileged. So any process can rearrange its own namespace freely. And you build, use those primitives to build and compose a namespace for an application. Finally, there's a file service protocol called 9P that is, uh, has, um, if you think of it as being NFS with a bugs fix, that's probably good enough for the talk. Um, the, and, as an example of how resources are represented in Plan 9, the interface to get a TCP IP connection, isn't a, there isn't a socket call. Instead, you open a file called NetTCP clone. You read a number from that. That's a, that's a directory number. Um, so here it's zero. So you open TCP clone, read, you get a value zero. And that gives you access to a directory that represents the connection. And you have the data, which you open and read and write to communicate with the thing on the far end. You have a control file into which you can write a connect request. Um, these are all text, this is all text messages into this one. So you say connect to this IP address and this port. And these two files are read-only files that show you which addresses correspond to the local address for the connection and the remote address for the connection. Um, uh, so that's, that's the low-level network interface. Then there are services like, so the interface on Plan 9 to DNS is that you open a file called, that's implemented by a, a process in the system, a service in the system, not uh, by a library. And you write the domain name you want to translate. And then you read back from the same open file um, a list of, um, uh, the, well, domain name and IP address and, and uh, well, indicator that it's an IP address and then the, the, the relevant address in both IPv4 and IPv6 format. And if you have a higher level, uh, so above that sits a, a connection service, which allows, if you put NetShriek there, um, it will allow different uh, uh, network uh, uh, um, protocols or um, technologies to be used. And it will, it will essentially find a way of getting to that system. And what it does, the interface then is you write a, a, a textual string to it for the thing you want to get to, and then you read a set of recipes um, as to how to get there. And the recipe is interpreted as this. Each line is the name of a file to open, and the string you write preceded by connect into that file to get a connection to the distant thing. And if there's more than one in there, you can try each one in turn until you get one that works. Second operating system, Inferno, which is what Limbo was designed to, to, to uh, designed for. So it's a small operating system. Um, it's written, the core of it is written in C. Um, it can run native or 
more unusually, it actually it works as um, all the components of the operating system are compiled and run as an application under some other operating system. Um, it's fairly portable. You've got x86 ARM support, various architectures. The key thing is that it provides the same interface everywhere for its programs. It's a full OS, so there are actual processes. Uh, it, um, some of the, there are a good set of commands, including its own shell. Um, the bulk of the Plan 9 commands were translated into Limbo. Um, but the reason for doing it, and the reason the interface is the same everywhere, is that the ideas of Plan 9 are applied by Inferno, even when it's hosted. So that it provides on each system, you know, whether it's Linux or Plan 9 or when it's running native, it provides slash prog, which is similar to slash proc, but for, for um, Inferno. It provides net TCP, net DNS, net CS, export and import commands, and so on. So that means that if you're running Inferno on a Linux system, you it, it will serve up, it, sorry, applications will use net TCP clone the way I you know, suggested before. Um, it has net DNS implementation that uh, completely hides all the binds of what is it now, system D stuff. Um, and it behaves in exactly the same way regardless of where you are. And finally, because it uses 9P as its file service protocol, um, it allows you on any node in the network, you can import slash net slash DNS, you can import slash net slash TCP from some other machine, even if it's running Linux, and use that on say Mac OS to make a, a, a call as if it were rooted through the, through the um, Linux system. And the application is unaware uh, uh, that it's running on any different system. Um, so there's the operating system level, there's a disk, is the abstract machine, and that's the abstract machine to which the Limbo uh, uh, programs are compiled. Uh, and to execute that, um, there's an interpreter and, uh, and a, a straightforward JIT. Uh, I mean, the JIT is fairly small. There are, I think they're about on the order of uh, uh, one and a half to 2,000 lines of, of, of C code. And on top of all that, the, the programming language for Inferno, um, the only one that's used by applications, is, is this language Limbo. Um, let me just, yeah, so th this gives you some of the uh, feeling of what a Limbo program looks like. And so this is a simple thing. So Limbo programs are structured as a, a set of modules. Um, a module has a specification. Um, modules are a type. Module has a specification. Uh, and then you can have one or more implementations of that module. So this is the signature. Um, this is an implementation of that. Um, so it's implementing an ADT called point, which has these uh, um, um, methods and member functions associated with it. And um, one of the key things about it is that the modules are dynamically loaded and unloaded. Um, and there can be more than one implementation. An implementation is selected by the path you use when you load. Um, so though points, points to path has a fixed constant here, uh, if you add other implementations of it, you might have um, um, yeah, um, a, yeah, a, a different name here, a different constant corresponding to a different version of it. So if you think of, um, say, uh, the idea of a collection uh, data structure, you might say, I want one that's fast for find and un union find, and other ones that's fast for something else. And the usage of these um, uh, member functions is, is very similar to, say, um, the old C with classes or, or, or C++ and that you apply um, a, a function to it. You, you have a value and you apply a member function to it. Um, the, uh, but even the, system, even the system interface, the system call interface is done by loading a module. Uh, as it happens, that's a built-in module, um, but it, it, it's, it's still a dynamic, a dynamic value. Um, that means that these values can change. Um, and the uh, syntax for, for getting to a thing is module points to um, a, a function at the, at the um, uh, outer level of the, uh, of the module declaration set. Um, so there's a loaded dynamically from a file name, but because it's running inside an, uh, uh, an Inferno environment, that file name can be bound in from other places. So you can substitute resources or even implementations by changing, rearranging the namespace for a process. 
At the point where it's loaded, that's the point at which it will be compiled. And it's turned into a, a more efficient form for interpretation as well. Uh, and if you've got the JIT enabled, it will typically be compiled there. And finally, um, you can unload a module if you don't want to don't want it needed by by um, uh, nulling out the the, the the last reference to it. Uh, one reason the um, yeah, so I'll, I'll discuss some of the reasons for for, 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 for that structure uh, um, uh, towards the end. Um, and it, here's an example of a system interface in in, in, in um, limbo through the sys module. Um, so the, the sys module provides there there are roughly 41 library functions of system calls provided by the sys module. Um, an interesting one is file to chan, and that takes a directory and a file name as strings. And it says put um, this file at this directory point in the in the current namespace um, generate a synthetic name connected to this data structure, where the data structure has a pair of channels that will be used to convey read and write requests. The read and write requests come when some client application opens that name and reads and writes. Then those come through the channels. Um, to represent the um, uh, the content of the of the read request, the offset, the the, the bytes of data, fit as a way of distinguishing different clients that have opened the file, and then finally there's this channel, um, the um, array of byte and string, which is given the name R read here. So what's happening here is that the channel is receiving a tuple, which contains a chan which is used for the private reply. So that uh, um, the, um, um, the, the process that, 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 that's, in, that's using file to chan um, will receive uh, requests and it can distinguish the different clients that open the, the, the file. And it can also ensure that the right response goes to the right uh, uh, application. And that, that, that structure of, of sending a chan through a channel a private is the way that RPCs are constructed in the system. So an RPC is just a tuple that, that happens to contain a channel, and that channel is the reply channel. Um, and so how is this used? Well, uh, an application will set up uh, on some conventional location the name of its service. Um, on that same host, it will export that service to the network. Um, the actual invocation is a bit more complicated, but this is the gist. Some other host will import from host A uh, the name. And then finally, that second host can open that chan, that, that, that name in its own namespace, and read and write, when it reads and writes, it accesses the, um, the service that's running on host A. So there's a sense in which, in this environment, um, things like publish and subscribe are done by just um, opening and reading and writing files. Um, uh, let's see if this works. And... Ah. Uh oh. Uh, yes, of course. Okay, so here's the heart. Yeah. So inside this Limbo program, this is how you create a, a process. This is how you create a process in Limbo. You just say spawn, and then you have a function call, and that starts a process to execute that to execute that function call. So it evaluates the parameters, and then it, and then it um, starts a separate process um, to, to do that. And here's the body of the. Um, so the, I've already done the I/O file to chan up above. Um, th this is a real program on Inferno, um, and the body of the server is just this alt loop where it receives read requests and write requests. Um, it fusses about a little bit to make sure that the data that it's that's providing. Uh, given the offset and count provided by the the, the the process doing the reader or the write, uh, 
it's trimmed to fit the data in the usual way for for, for um, um, uh, in the usual way for for uh, Unix like IO requests. Um, and then so the and the RC here is the reply channel, um, and it 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 sends the sends the the data down that, and that will eventually end up being the the the, the data that turns up in the buffer that someone has provided with by read on the other end. Uh, one other thing to notice here, um, which was sort of skipped over in the um, um, Newspeak, uh, Newspeak uh, example, is that you've got this colon equal operator, which isn't assignment. It's um, it's a, 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 the use of a type inference, so that it's a declaration and assignment. So the colon is so if you think of the declaration of variables here as being um, a colon int equals three. Um, then there's a short form where you can write a colon equal three, and it declares and and assigns, and that's also used in Go. Uh, right. And it has gone out of present mode. Oh. Cool. Um, right. And um, let me just before I do this one, I'll just nip back to look more de oh, in detail at this. So that that's the type inference I was referring to, um, and that that's characteristic of the languages from from now on. Uh, mentioned the module oriented aspect of it, but this is fundamental the way that things that the, the, the limbo applications are structured is it's a collection of modules. Uh, the type system, it's got int real and big, which is 64 bit, int is 32 bit. Uh, you've got tuples um, for ADTs. Originally, there wasn't parametric uh, polymorphism, but uh, we added it at Vitanova. Um, there's a pick uh, variant within ADT that allows you to express. Um, alternatives, and then there's a pick statement that allows you to inspect which alternative an ADT was using. So it gives you discriminated unions. Um, there are pointers, but they're controlled, unlike say C or C++. Um, they're all, it's more like Pascal, where it's always a point to the heap. And you can have a you can have a, also have a, a pointer to a function, which binds a module uh, a function module instance together, so you can you you, you can invoke functions indirectly. The arrays, arrays are unusual because they're reference types rather than values. So the type doesn't include the size. Um, if you film with Go, they're very similar to Go slices. Um, there's a list type which acts like a stack. Um, so you can push a value on the front of it. You can create a list by pushing a value on a nil of appropriate type. You get the head of the, the element at the head of the list and the element at the tail of the list. These turn out to be quite useful with concurrent programming because the um, well, uh, so the arrays when you do take a slice of an array using this notation, um, if you take a, have a big buffer and you give a slice to each client, you know that they cannot move outside that that region. Similarly, if you send someone a list, although the values in the list are not immutable, the list itself is immutable from that point. Um, so you can send that, and you don't have to worry about it. Behind the scenes, there's a um, uh, a garbage collection system, um, and it's a little unusual in in Lim Limbo because it guarantees that if something is if something can be reference counted, in other words, it contains no cycles, then the moment the last reference goes goes away, the data will be collected at that point. And that's used to implement things like windows that automatically vanish when the last reference to them disappear. It's also used, there isn't a closed system call because it's, um, all you have to do is have the last reference to the file go away. Uh, and then of course there are chans and buffered channels. Processes are, now unlike LF, processes are cheap in the sense that they don't correspond to operating system processes. Instead, limber processes are multiplexed uh, behind the scenes by the underlying implementation across heavier weight processes when needed. And if they're only needed if you have to do system IO system calls, and otherwise it multiplexes them in much the same way as a coroutine system might. Um, so they're, they're, they're quite cheap. It's mostly just a PC and a stack. Um, 
At region level, we so error handling comes up a bit later. Um, at region level, we added uh, exceptions in the style of clue, um, so that a, a function can be declared as raising a particular exception or set of exceptions, and exceptions are uh, a limited uh, data type in, in the language. And so all this stuff compiles to the abstract machine, as I mentioned, and it's uh, an essential feature of the language that, that all the linkages are dynamic. Um, it's also not clear here, but you can load um, the module type system um, allows you to load anything that's a superset of the module that, that, that you're trying to load. You know, that's it, 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 you know, so anything that satisfies at least the spec you're trying to load is adequate. So if you have a module that implements more operations, it's still good enough to, 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 to be loaded as, as that other type. Okay, so. Right, finally we get to Go. Um, and Go, in some ways, is more, so I'm not looking too much at the syntactic aspects of things, um, Go adds a variety of, 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 of new control structures. It re removes some so that it only has a for loop rather than whiles and do whiles. And the for is generalized. It also has new syntactic conventions compared to the previous ones. For example, um, for the first time since, uh, 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 in a sort of mainstream language since 1967 um, with BCPL, um, it will, uh, Although syntax, the, the grammar has semicolons in the language, um, it will actually provide them automatically for you. Um, and so it gives it a slightly distinctive appearance with, with these, all these missing semicolons. Um, the type system has a number of novelties compared to the previous ones. One of them is uh, this type definition, where you can say, um, you can take an existing type and give it a new name, and that allows you to add operations to the original set. Uh, so here I'm adding an operation odd to uh, my, my string, which is a, a, a new type built on the string. Um, and I can then create my strings using string literals. Um, and if I print these things out, it will say um, um, frowny face uh, uh, when I invoke that. Um, I can also index into my string as if it were a string. Uh, but the type my string is not compatible with string as such. So it's a distinct type. See, so the effect is very similar, as I say here, to, to Ada's derived type, where you say thing is new integer. Um, and you can do the same for int. It's also why, um, different from, say, um, LF or um, um, Limbo, the, the, the struct type, which uh, reverts to that name from ADT, the, uh, the struct type doesn't include a specification of operations on it. Instead, they're just the operations are defined with that type as a receiver in a declaration like this. So it's similar to the, the Oberon style of, or Oberon 2 style of, of, of defining these things. So th this says that, um, uh, and syntactically it sits in the position where it will be when you, uh, when you invoke it. So this says that, this has a receiver which takes a value of my string uh, uh, and the, uh, um, which will be assigned to the value s here. So there isn't a magic thing called this. There's, there's just a, particular, a, a parameter in it that has a special position. Um, the other key thing about the Go type system is this interface um, type. Uh, and you see here that, that, so here's an interface, it's taken from the, the Go reference manual that finds a, a, um, a block type that's apparently used for encryption and decryption. And it's just a sequence of signatures, uh, functions. Um, so there's a block size returning int and encrypt and decrypt that take uh, um, source and dest arrays of bytes. What that allows is that any um, type, typically a struct type, that has those operations associated with it can be passed in as a parameter to um, so this function um, that takes one of these block, oops, block interfaces uh, in, and this then runs the appropriate, that runs whatever algorithm it's given on these, uh, on these associated things. So that uh, the crypto library in, in Go is structured as, as, as having a, a common signature represented by the interface, and then applications that want to, to use that 
uh, can simply name that interface and they can are then able to use any uh, uh, suitable uh, um, actual cipher uh, to, to, to do it. Um, the other additions are, um, so it has pointers. The syntax of declarations is different. It adds a map type uh, built into the language that allows you to, to index, uh, to create maps where you can look up keys of arbitrary type and, assign, and, and have values of arbitrary type. And there's a syntax to check to see whether or not the, that uses tuples to, or multiple assignment to check to see whether or not the, the map contains a value. Um, if you don't use that syntax, then it gives you what's known as, there's this notion of a zero value in Go, uh, and you'll get that instead. Um, the uh, other distinct, yeah, so there's a collection of, of four statement extensions that iterate over, over, over various kinds of, of, of structures, including channels. So that means run until the channel is closed. Um, error handling is typically done explicitly. In fact, a lot of the uh, aim of the language is to make, um, have explicit linkage and explicit costs for things rather than having a lot of implicit uh, uh, um, operations. You know, by contrast, if you think of, uh, say, the way that uh, C sharps .NET Core stuff is put together. Um, there's a whole load of, of, of implicit dependency injections to, 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 to acquire links to other things. None of that appears here. Uh, it, it's, it, uh, the aim is to keep things explicit. So you can, you can trace back and see where thing, values come from. Similarly, with error handling, um, there's been this, um, um, Evolution, so that you start off with LF had rescue blocks. So you would say, allocate these two things, rescue by unallocating them and returning a value, alloc this, um, rescue it by unallocating that. And if you do a raise here, then it, it does that rescue. If you do a raise here, it does those two. So it's a local exception handling thing, a bit like the way you might use set jump and long jump, but with a lot more volatiles. Um, in limbo, uh, it was one of the first things, uh, to, uh, times I saw this, um, a, there was a convention that uh, functions that returned an error returned a string. Functions that returned a value and an error returned uh, a tuple that contained the value and a string. And then there was an explicit check to see uh, if the error string was set, then you um, typically ignored the value and um, um, to generate a diagnostic. But it did also allow the possibility that you could, that some things might be defined to produce a, a, a maybe a default value and an error string, and it was up to the caller to decide whether which priority to give it. But the point is that it, 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 the error is checked, and it's checked by primitives of the language. You just use normal if statements to do that, normal function calls, normal int, uh, if statements, and Go carries that on, but adds to it because in Go's case, it's not a string. It's a special interface, uh, a, a built-in interface that ha defines um, an error uh, function. So anything that satisfies that interface can be returned as the error type. Um, and that's combined with a defer statement, which is sort of similar to the, 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 the rescue, but more general, um, that evaluates this function when the function, so this um, expression uh, uh, when the function uh, returns. Uh, so the, the common convention is that you, you open a file, um, you defer the close, and then however you end the exit the function, if, it's a, if, if a trap occurs, uh, uh, which is known as a panic in, in, in Go, or, or normally um, that file would be closed. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, so, well, actually, the limbo in limbo we added exception handlers, as I said before, um, because um, uh, to avoid some unpleasantness. Um, well, let's go to the yes. So that's, now I'll start comparing, just looking at Aleph, Limbo, and Go. So you've got all these you know, similarities. You, you could see from the screen, if you could see that much, uh, that they're very similar sort of syntax. Um, um, they're all similar, use the same uh, concurrency style. So what are some differences? Well, LF was compiled in very conventional way. It had a C linking model, so there wasn't even necessarily type checking between mod, uh, uh, separate files. Uh, there was no garbage collection. 
it was as low level in many ways as in C. It wasn't a safe language. Um, you could scribble over stuff. It had both procs and tasks because processes there were operating system processes, which were sometimes too heavyweight. Um, uh, and it had some other minor differences in the type system and, and, and with the error handling. Uh, Limbo had an abstract machine, the disk machine, although it did have a JIT to speed things up. It had a hybrid garbage collector, so it had uh, reference counting as the first step, but there was a backup concurrent mark sweep detector to handle cycles. But it meant, but because this was defined in some sense at the language level, that meant that you could rely on the resources being reclaimed. It had procs, which were multiplexed across operating system processes, so the need for the distinction between procs and tasks vanished. Um, and then so we looked briefly at the error handling, but it's similar to most of these. Dynamic modules, loading and unloading. Array is a reference type. Um, Go, you've got an optimizing compiler. Um, a garbage collector that's not built in, sorry, that's not associated with, you know, sorry, its properties are not guaranteed by the language. Um, it hasn't got this some idea of, of, uh, of non-cyclic structures. It has go routines, um, which are similar to limbo processes, um, that there are some subtle differences. Um, but for these purposes, it's enough to say that they're also very cheap and the idea is you should be able to have lots and lots of them. And they're multiplexed across uh, a heavier weight thing behind the scenes. It's got interfaces to do the, the dynamic uh, aspect that was uh, handled by modules there. Um, its structuring mechanism is by static packages, though. Um, static linking and static naming. Um, so there isn't the dynamic aspect there. Interesting, arrays are values in Go, not um, they aren't reference types. Instead, there's a separate slice type, which is a very similar syntax. Uh, that represents a, 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 a reference into a into an array. And more interestingly, Limbo has got strings of runes, which are Unicode code points. Go uses strings of bytes. In fact, there, a few of the primitives in the language do regard them as being UTF-8 representation of Unicode characters or code points. But in fact, a, a string can contain any byte pattern, including zeros and so on. Um, and that seems at first to be a slightly strange retrograde thing that you go back to having almost a C-like but counted string of, of bytes as opposed to a high level concept of a character and, 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 and manipulating things. It's a basic type three shows how having strings is anything other than bytes. Yes, yes. I mean, the, the, this is uh, uh, it's exceptional handling. This is part of it. So here's it, so here's the uh, here's the thing. So this is looking back at at, at the various choices. Um, so what the environment are these things meant to be? So Squeak was just a lab experiment, really. LF was intended to do low-level systems programming, but with concurrent programming primitives available. In fact, it was to, to, used to to write a network stack uh, and and some other low-level things. Um, they ran it uses in user space, but still low-level. New Squeak was a little bit of a lab experiment, um, but more of a proof of concept, but it was meant to be more realistic as a language. Limbo was intended to be used on set-top boxes, uh, smallish embedded systems, but also supporting servers, which is where the, the MU part came in. So you had this environment spanning this whole range. The idea was to create a, 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 an, an easy to uh, integrate um, distributed system. You could build your own distributed systems easily. Go, well, that was Google. So it's large scale systems really. And there was an emphasis on, or there is an emphasis on efficiency that they've shunned operations um, that, that, that uh, you know, look small, but might be, might be expensive. You know, one example would be the ability to receive on an array of channels vanished uh, between Limbo and Go for, the, for that reason. But it's also why, uh, you know, quite apart from the Python, yeah, the, the uh, fuss in dealing with, 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 with uh, um, Unicode in the way that you mentioned. There is an efficiency aspect to it as well, which is that if you are reading loads and loads of data, you don't really want to have that all converted into arrays of runes. So you want to be able to operate it on it directly. Um, and, so, and so things like that. And, and similarly with arrays, um, it's, it's actually a bit of a nuisance sometimes to have no value, arrays as values in number. 
But if you only had a raised value, Limbo originally did that. It was horrendously expensive. It was too much copying. So they switched to having a raise as a reference type. Go has both, so that it has arrays as a block, which you sometimes do want, and it also has this ability to, to, to have, cut references into them. Um, and, and again, that's connected with the, the way in which the language is going to be applied. Um, uh, and there are these other decisions. Do you, want to, you know, do you want to allow for interpretation or should it be compiled? Well, in, in the case, if you're building a large scale system, uh, although you can use Python and other things in these places, it, it's clear that if you have a compiled system and you can get all the benefits of some of these others, you're probably slightly better off if you really have large scale stuff to do. Um, and some of these static and dynamic, well, there is no real need, or not the same need to have dynamic stuff there because you're doing the same thing over and over again a lot. By contrast, the idea here was that you're dealing with resource limited systems and you wanted to be able to delete modules. So you, you, you load modules and you have that expense only while you need them and then you can drop them and go on to do something else within the same space. Um, and processes, well, LF versus the rest there, because it turns out that it's really nice to have very cheap processes that you can just create and destroy in the same way that channels are cheap enough that you can have a channel that, that exists just for the purpose of one IO request and then you, it goes away again. The garbage collection characteristics, again, are different. Um, LF didn't have it and it turned out to be a real pain uh, in terms of guaranteeing correctness. Uh, Limbo has, uh, again, back to the limited space on the smaller devices, um, it was important, and it still is important, that, that the reference counting be the primary method for, for, for handling certain structures, because it gets rid of the stuff right away. You don't have to wait for a garbage collection cycle to go. So your overall load, the memory load is typically much less. But you need the backup one, because it's a pain, it turns out to be a pain, you know, historically, in early Limbo, uh, not to be able to have cyclic structures. And there's all business about error handling, but that's that that's that's one that seems to be much more um, designer's opinion. Um, so, <clears throat> um, right. But so we've gone to all this trouble. I got the CSP model into vastly wider use only for the virtual machine in a Dijkstra sense to change. Because serverless, uh, is CSP useful for that? In a client server thing of spontaneous requests? I mean, if you look at the average server web, using web server in Go, you don't use Go routines except for, comp, you know, um, log, you know, for structuring reasons. Um, um, because because the requests appear and then they go away again and there's no state. Or you know, the AWS style serverless stuff, uh, the Lambda function stuff. You, you can write those in Go, but uh, this, you, you don't get to use the, the, the primitives. So what do we do? Um, it's the old problem that, that we just get everything sorted out in terms of language and how to write programs nicely and, and, and securely. And then they go and change the machine. It's back to Dijkstra moaning about the IBM 620 and the interrupt handling stuff. Uh, um, that, that you know, they give us, how do people you know, give us stuff that we don't know how to do? Here it's software people doing the same thing. So how do we compose intermittent sporadic program snippets? So it's something for people to, this is new stuff you can do. Um, yeah. there, there have been some extra language, I mean, composition languages that sit outside languages to do it. But that seems, can we, can, you know, is, there, is there not some possibility um, of, 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 of doing it within a language? Um, and yeah, so we, we start all over again. Um, uh, oh, except this is one, yeah, all the way back to the squeak. It, it, it has occurred to me in several projects that actually it might be quite useful for very small processes like you know, the ESP stuff and, and uh, to, to, to make use of something like squeak to generate the application. 